I got a joke for the comedy thing mm -hmm. is that I don't f with service dogs and midgets because they get privileges that they shouldn't have. Can you say little people though? Midgets the thing that hurts people. I say, yeah, I, so you I, say I, I have people. a problem with little people. If you say and, little people, there he is. What's up, bro? <laughs> good with it, bro. How you feeling, man? Cool, how about you? Long time coming, man. What's up, man? man? What's up, man? Good to see you, fam. Appreciate you. Thank how you doing, man? Appreciate you, bro. Yes, pleasure, sir. Pleasure, pleasure. Gentlemen. And hey, you came in smelling like an OG, too. Yo, yeah, you know, that's, that's OG. You know how all the uncles, when they come around to the cookout, they always got that good cologne. I'm yeah, uncle age now. Yeah, I thought you were taller, dog. Thanks. <laughs> God damn, Freddie. <laughs> you know, no, shoot no. shots and walk in. I was just saying, man, I thought Freddy. you were taller. You man. said it like I was 5'9 or something. No, 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 not like that. Damn. No, I'm talking about like 6'5 or something. Oh, oh, no, no. no yeah, I realize no. too, he an entertainer, so he around a lot of little people. That yeah. makes sense, too. He a giant in entertainment world. I'm glad y'all in New Jersey. I'm glad to be it's here. It's good man. to see you, bro. Yeah, we've been it's moving up here all the time. Nice. They shot Pump It Up the on the basketball. They had a basketball court scene, so you probably just thought he was tall. It's a fact. <laughs> the best thing about New York is looking at. What's crazy <laughs> is whether it's like clear and the weather is good, or even on a sh night like this, Matt, you said, where's Matt? Matt got the photos where it's kind of foggy and you can see the skyscrapers and skyline in the fog. That's dope. Too. No, it's always a different view out there. Yeah. Always. I love it. What's up, man? What's up, man? What, what, I came because sort of... you called. I appreciate it. I normally would have stayed away from this messy shit that you're trying to do. I know you're trying to be messy. <laughs> and I get, I get myself in enough mess. <laughs> oh, that was your producer genius that was like, hey, we had him? <laughs> Why don't we see what Joe thinks? I, I get my own experiences with people. I would hate for people to do that to me. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cow pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cow pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, well, welcome sure. to the pivot, Joe, Thank man. You. We yeah. appreciate you. We Thank got you. Joe Button, Channing, Freddie T. I'm RC. Um, I mean, shoot, I've probably been DMing with you, messaging back and forth with you for years. Yes, so, for some years. So I'm really excited, man, to sit down and chop it up. Um, I was reading the, the Complex article on you and just talking about, you know, you were number one on their, their hip-hop media rankings. And, and something that you said there, like, sort of stuck with me when you were just talking about consistency. And I want to take it a different place from the consistency of the work you put out and the consistency in the human. Because people take you as controversial, you've had certain beefs because of the things you said, but I never have an issue with you because you consistently you. Me, yeah. How difficult is that though, coming from a world where you were an artist or you are an artist and you understand what it is like to be one and now you're the guy on the other side of the microphone talking about some of the works they put out, knowing how much they put into those things. It's just a blessing. Like, it's a, it's a blessing. I have managed to claw and scrap my way through all of these different phases of life, and I've landed in a place where I run shit. So you can be as crazy as you want, as free as you want. I talk with my friends. Like, everything about this is a gift. I normally don't do well with ceilings over me, and at every stop in the music business, there's, a, there's this invisible ceiling. And once I find out about it, it's normally going to be erratic. I got my record deal. I was 20, 20 years old, 21 years old. Most of these people have maybe seen me kind of grow up, mm -hmm. make the mistakes in public. Many, many, many mistakes, too. A whole lot of them. But all of my yesterdays lead me to today. Like, where, where we are today and the creative freedom and just the space and just the years of experience that I could apply to now my own team and my own show. Man, none, none greater. Joe, have you really grown up? Shit. <laughs> shit. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell shit. Oh, man, I wish I could tell you. Because you'll pour some gas on the fire in a heartbeat, and some might say, oh, why he do that? Like, that's child bad. Build and destroy. Okay. Build and destroy. And in some instances, I maybe went about it the wrong way mm -hmm. or expressed myself the wrong way. But the intent is always pure. Right. The intent is always for the better, for the better of everyone. It's, it's never like a selfish act. When I was uh, 
when I had my back and forth with uh, Shady Records and Eminem, mm -hmm. and, and I was fighting for me and my brothers to get a better situation. Uh, if I was, and one other fights if I had, I don't forgot all of them now, but <laughs> yeah, there was always a good intent behind it all, right. is what I'm trying to say. Okay. And bro, it's, I had a different question I'm gonna ask you, but when you see lions like yourself, dog, and RC schooled me today, I'm not a music dude. I don't listen to music, I'm, I'm my mama white, so. <laughs> I, I listen to talk radio and shit. But he schooled me today about you, and for you to say, like, I don't know how many beats I've been in, is there anything that you regret? Because a lot of times lions don't regret anything. You can't regret any of it. But is there anything where, like, you look back, because, like, you bring up Shady Records, but then you couldn't bring up, you couldn't think of nothing else. You know what I'm saying? Like, is there anything where you look back, like, I should have dealt with that a different way? Oh, shit, I say that a lot, looking back. But I don't regret any of it, because I pulled a lesson from it. Right. Yeah. Like, all of the yesterdays lead to today. If I change one thing, then the outcome, then the result is different. Yeah. But what, what's, what's the biggest one, like, you look back and, like, I should have, I could have navigated that different? Uh, well, I start from the beginning. Uh, when Jay-Z got his the role as president at Def Jam, I was a young artist mm -hmm. on Def Jam trying to work on my second album. And at that time, a lot of the artists on Def Jam had an issue with Jay-Z being the president. This was the first time that a, a rapper, our peer, was like calling the shots in charge of DMX release date and LL release date, and none of us took that well. Right. And I really didn't take well. I didn't handle myself well at all. Every interview that they booked for me, I kicked their back in. Every chance I got in front of a microphone, I had to just disparaging things to say about people who were ultimately maybe trying to help me. And even if they weren't trying to help me, if I would have helped myself, I would have been in a different predicament. But I didn't. Gas, gas on the fire. Mm -hmm. Gas on the fire. What made you that sort of fighter, that sort of personality? Like I have a, I have a personality. It's not, it's maybe not as like, probably because my voice is not as deep. It's, it, it doesn't make people kind of get defensive right away. But I have a voice that when I've had enough or when I get a certain feeling, I have to say it. And there are, there are, there are times, bro, I could go like two weeks, yo, and I know the thing I want to say, I shouldn't say. I know that there are gonna be some ramifications and consequences from what I say that I don't wanna deal with or I want someone to deal with necessarily as well, but the, the need for respecting me, the need for great, And you do a fucking great job at that. I know you wanted to tell that last nigga something different than you told him <laughs> back and forth. But, <laughs> yeah. but you know what I'm saying? So what, what was it about you though that in a situation like with Jay or when you have the situation uh, you know, with him, some of these different conversations you've had, what is it about you that, make, that gives you the need to make sure you express yourself? I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Like, I'm gonna tell you that that's right. not who I, I, I wouldn't be me. I would, my mind, I would be a different person if, if that were the case. I mean, hopefully I figured out better ways to be expressive, but expression is, is, is my DNA. That's, that's the root of, there is no Joe Budden without the art of expression. So I, we gotta do it. And niggas be on fuck shit. <laughs> and niggas be on fuck shit a lot, especially in the music industry. So when you see that enough and everybody got an ulterior motive and an agenda yeah. and everybody's a liar and everybody, it's just like enough is enough now. Let's just shoot the shit straight. Like we, we know what time it is. We, you know, before we grown, we done been around the block. I don't have time to play no more. Growing up here in this space in hip hop, right? In the city, being on Def Jam, um, label, lot, the roster is crazy historically, right? What was it like as a young artist? Ooh. Man, I don't even think I even knew what was going on at the time, and I don't, we'll never see nothing like that again. Like, mm -hmm. outside of the artists that were there, and we talking about old Def Jam. Yeah, old right. Def Jam is, that's the one as a kid, you know, with the record player on the vinyl that mm -hmm. you want to be a part of that. Outside of the artists, on the exec side, in that building, we'll never see nothing like it. We, we had Leo Cohen, Kevin Lowes, uh, Julie, who's at Atlantic, uh, fucking Mike Kaiser, Sean Pecos, Shaka is in there, Irv is in there, Dame is in there. Like every 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 top exec is in there, uh, every top artist is in there. And Def Jam wasn't really known for signing young rappers. Right. Mm -hmm. Like Def Jam was known for signing legends. So when I came, they signed me to something. It was an imprint called Spit Records. And see, so from day one we on bullshit. 
<laughs> See, but I don't, I don't know that. You're though. on spit. Right. I'm on spit. <laughs> <laughs> Was the, it an acronym? No, that shit just said spit. <laughs> <laughs> it was spit records. So I would come in the building and pass all this Hall of Fame pictures and then walk to spit. <laughs> and finally, I mean, what the fuck is spit? Oh, it's some, it's you, did you like the rapping Dalmatians? This is some other shit we're trying for the new artists. And if you do good over here, then we'll upstream you to where you, mm. you know. So I worked my way out of that. And now you're just a young artist on a roster full of legends, and nobody really took too kind to that. What was it about music that made you love it? I made him listen to 10 Minutes today. It's my favorite Joe Button song. I came up in church. You came up in church? I came up in church. I sing, listened sing. to 10 Minutes today. I came that, up. That, that wasn't biblical. <laughs> Shit, yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. Shit, I feel like you asking me things that are just like, that's just who that guy is. Like, music, more more expression. And it didn't start that way, right? It started with uh, maybe poems and just journaling and singing. And then that turned into something when I went to high school and got around a whole bunch of bad, bad kids. Right. Then it was, oh shit, this is how I can express myself. And boy, did I have a lot of shit that I needed to express. I had a lot that needed to get out. Talk about the eras of, of Joe Button. I think, you know, 03, I was living here actually. You know, you have Pump It Up, which becomes a, a huge hit. But if you listen to the album, that was kind of like the anomaly yeah. of who... It's deep, deep and dark. Yeah, Joe Button was. How did you, how did you like deal with that? Like, how, how did you draw the, the connection to the Pump It Up and everybody feeling like you, that's who you were or that's who they wanted you to be, but truly being a different person? Well... Those were more fights between me and the label at the time because they were teaching me record label politics, which I didn't understand, which in 2003 is uh, a lot of girls, a lot of clubs, a lot of drinking, a lot of smoking, just a lot, just a movie, just organized chaos. That wasn't who I was at all. Like I was, I was not street, not drug dealer. Like my story, it was tough for people to resonate with in 2003, but you know, I hit one out the park. Yeah. Like, I thank God, I thank God for Pump It Up. They told me it was my turn at the plate, and I hit that shit. And from there, I got back into being myself. Everything was dark, everything was, that was always the, the uh, a confliction that we had mm -hmm. between the label and me. Do I lose who I am and be who y'all are telling me to be because that will sell some records, or do I just do what's true to my heart and my soul and see where that gets me, even though it's against whatever you're saying? I went with the latter. But isn't it about the money? It's never about the money. I was rapping to live. I was rapping to live. Yeah, but I never you, made to money. live though, bro. I you gotta eat no and money. give it a roof over your head. And I, I would, I would assume Pump It Up got the most. It's funny because I knew, I knew Pump It Up. I was out there drinking and smoking and doing all that. I am that dude. <laughs> but one day we sitting there writing notes and he put your album on the o, the O three one. I was like, this ain't the pump it up guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's the pump it up yeah. guy. This nigga's mad. And I was. But, and but I isn't was. it about that? Like, do you love pump it up? Because that. But Absolutely. It, but it's not, like you just said, it's not you. That's not true. It is me. That's not, um, I didn't feel that it represented me the best. I'm Jersey. This is Jersey Club. Mm -hmm. We the, It's the home of that shit. So, cool. Let's dance. And I was a dancer at that age. I was the guy. Walking in the club, you hear a song. Hey, hey. I was, but I was around some street niggas, so they looking at me. This <laughs> nigga <think of> dancing, <laughs> shit like that. Yeah, but now nah, I'm super proud to pump it up. Yeah. Now, when uh, there was dark moments in my career where the record was weaponized against me, like right, like you put that record out, you don't see any more major label success, you don't see any more radio success. Now all of those great people I told you about have left the building. Mm -hmm. It's L.A. Reid in the building now, who's R&B mm -hmm. icon. I'm not R&B. And L.A. looks out for Atlanta. He looks out for his people. So now we're getting Jeezy. And now we're getting, yeah. it's a whole new wave of just trying to stay afloat in there. But no, pump it up. Shit. No. Yeah, they tried. It was one hit wonder. It was what else could he do? What could he produce? It was all of that. Wow. But I just worked through it. I always hung my hat on my ability to rap and my ability as 
an MC, right? Like this shit started two turntables in a park. So I just always hung my hat on that. It didn't matter about the records. Yeah. It didn't matter about the record sales. What do you have to say as an MC, as a man? What are you, what are you, what are you doing? So that's, that was always Joe Budden. How many notepads of un, unreleased written music you got in the stash? Joe Budden didn't do unreleased. No. Oh, you mean currently, like now? Yeah, if you got something no. from back in the day in the stash. I put everything out. Yeah? I put it all out. I put rough copies out, unmixed, unmixed records, unmastered <laughs> records. As soon as I did it and wanted the people to get it, I put that shit out. Mm -hmm. A lot of times to my detriment, because that's not what the industry was back then. Right. But yeah, I would let them fly. That's why a lot of my catalog, you really can't even pull up, because most of it is mixtape yeah. stuff. Right. Right. And there is nowhere today for a mixtape to live. Like, the business wasn't right for all of that stuff with samples and other people's beats and just licensing. So all that shit kind of just went away. I know this might be a bit rhetorical, but your answer, however, what's had the biggest impact on the hip-hop community? Your music or the podcast? I'd say the podcast probably easily. Easily. It's, it touches too many people. Plenty of people that wouldn't be attracted to my rhyming style or my voice or my cadence or just anything, right? But in podcasting, you just attract such a wider net. You're just talking to people from all over the world. You're getting to highlight other artists that may need it. I remember how I felt hearing my song on the radio for the first time. It's nothing like it in the world. Nothing like it in the world. It have to be like your first tackle or some shit. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, giving other artists that opportunity is fire. Like seeing them get excited, seeing them retweet, seeing people say, one day if I get my shit played in the Joe Budden podcast, mm -hmm. it's like, that's big for, for a guy like me. Right. Like I never saw that. I was never the, that was never my role. In, in hip hop. So that feels good to kind of be the conduit right. for music lovers. Lead from the front. Yeah. Joe, you compared what you wanted to do with hip hop from the media side to sports commentate, saying that we had so much that we could talk about, so much that we could kind of have these conversations about. But another part of that is competition. When, yeah. when you look at your podcast and what it's been able to accomplish and every day you sit down to do it, do you see it as a competition? Is it, no matter what, whenever I sit down here, whenever I share my thoughts, I want to be the absolute best in this space at doing it. Yeah, I'm in competition with anything that streams. Anything that streams, I'm in competition with. And that's without me having to sit down on my set. Like, in my own life, there's music I want to listen to that I don't get around to because I'm watching a show. There's a show I want to watch that I don't get around to because I'm listening to a podcast. Oh shit, there's another podcast, I got to make time I got to create time. It's the same thing that we ask the consumers to do. How are y'all creating time and space in your life for the things that you love? So yeah, we, I'm competing with the sports people. I'm competing with the actors, the actresses, the news people, game show people, judges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they yeah. all competition to me. Yeah. Are you a runner though? No. And and this is this is what I mean by it. You had Def Jam. You had a solo career. You had Slaughterhouse, which, you know, you said. You're partly, you're, you're to blame for that. You did EDS, you've been on Spotify, you've been, you've been, you've done all this stuff. You had the original Joe Button podcast. You have this mm -hmm. Joe Button podcast. It's either you're running or you see things better or you're toxic. Why is that? Up? Expound. Because if everything that you're a part of is something new, it's either you're, you're leaving for some reason, right? You're saying, okay, this is better. I think, I think I want to do this as opposed to doing this with these people. I follow what you're saying. Now. Right? Okay. Or it's part of me, something in me can allow these relationships to continue to work and be sustainable. What do you think it is that you jump from different things, from different people in that manner? If I'm gonna be honest, man, it may come off really arrogant here, but I'll say it. In most of the instances that you speak of, or most of the times where you hear that Joe Budden bugged out and ruined some shit, Joe Budden created it. It, it didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. So once I create it, no, that's not the time for all the chefs to come in the kitchen and start fucking with the potato salad. Mm -hmm. You can't come in there and just start throwing raisins and grapes in, in, in my shit. And while I'm still, I'm still standing in the kitchen, you just mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> now you're telling me contracts, how much money you can make with some shit that I made. 
that don't work on me because I'm going to always feel like I can make something else. Mm. I'm going to always, I, the creators are like the fucking, we the superheroes of the planet, man. I'm always on our side. None of them on that other side could tell me shit because I'm going to always go do it again. My success rate is out of the, it's out of here. It really is. They can't, yeah, they can't tell me nothing. So if I, I look you in the face and I don't like what you're saying about my creation, then you can have it. Because typically when I leave, it dies. Mm -hmm. That's the track record too. So, yeah, I clap it up for that. <laughs> I, cla I clap it up for Shout that. Shout out, drink, drink, drink champs, drink I, champs. <laughs> yeah, and it's a, no, I don't, I don't want to leave some shit because there's some bullshit going on and, and, and then see it su succeed without me. No, fail. Y'all took me for granted, the shit I was saying. And I'm typically right. So there's never a situation that you left that you feel like, I'm gonna go recreate this or I'm gonna create something else because I've consistently done it throughout my life. Like that's my resume, that's my track record. And you also look at whatever you created in this sense that you hope they could continue it because that's also a part of your creation. Like you don't ever feel like I can have all these branches off this tree that I've created. Well, of course, but not when something is rooted in evil. Mm. If something is rooted in fall fallacy and, and evil, no, we out of there. We out of there. No, burn that shit to the ground. Who gives a fuck? It's along the same path RC is going. Because I love it. Like, you, you the, I don't give a damn what nobody think about me. I don't need to be concerned with that. But I'm that dude, too. But I always say it. Like, my wife, my close circle, my parents. Like, I will listen to their opinion. I'll listen to what they say. Yeah. And the I'm world, just, who's you this person? Mad. And I'm the same way. That, I was going to ask, and who, who holds you accountable and whose opinion do you care Oh, my about? network is strong. My, my mom, my dad, my family, my friends, my girl, my kids, mm -hmm. both of them. That's my group. Anything outside of that, it's noise. It's noise. But I have a, I'm extremely close with both my parents. Mm -hmm. Like, every day, daily. It's, I don't have a thought that mm -hmm. either one of them don't know about. Wow. Yeah, and they know how to respond to me. If I'm in, if, if people in my life is important that they know how to respond to me when all this outside bullshit start going on. People start picking up the phone, seeing some shit on the internet, <laughs> and you know, it'll start affecting the people that love you. But my people now pretty much understand, they get it, they understand. Yeah. They, they know what's going on at all times. When scary hours drop, did you feel, hey. did you feel some sense of pride? Because no. did you feel like I made Drake go back and rap? Uh, that, no, I'm not that self-centered. I, I think that I think that outside of the shenanigans, there was some truth in something I said. And when he went to sleep at night, he probably thought about it. And whatever he did from that, he did from it. Awesome. Rappers rapping like the bars in hell. Yeah. <laughs> the bars in fucking hell. But for you, take me through through your process of evaluating other artists' work, right? Because like I know when I sit down to watch a game. I have a certain perspective I see it from in the sense that because I played safety, I see everything from the back end forward, mm -hmm. right? And the quarterback is what I get to last because that is my perspective. That's my experience. That's my focal point. Mm -hmm. And then when I try to regurgitate or communicate that, I try to start that from within and think about how I would want people to talk about my play, how I want people to talk about my character. When you are assessing these artists as humans or this art, these artists works, what's your focus or what's your approach to doing so? Everybody is their own bar. I start there. So if I'm talking Drake, I'm only comparing him to Drake. If we talking future, I'm comparing him to future unless we get into the field. But everybody is just against themselves. And then we start with what, what they're trying to do. Like what is their, what is their main purpose for this album? Some people are just trying to sell records. Some people only want to sell records to white people. Some people just want to be popping in the hood or in the club or have bops in the street. So, I mean, it's just all about what that person is trying to do. But I'm always focused on the music. Um, what inspired it? What was the muse? Is this person okay? Uh, why are they sharing certain things? Mm. Why are they releasing things at a certain time? I'm assessing the rollout. Uh, the marketing, the promotion, I'm, I'm looking at all of it. Just because there's always something, it's always smoke and mirrors in the industry, right? So whatever people say it is, it ain't, it's always more. Especially as an artist. I know what it's like to cram some shit that you feel in, in, in the eighth bar, in the third verse, and people just miss it because we dancing and bopping. Right. So there's a lot of that. 
expressive. Like artists are expressive and they're expressing even if nobody's noticing it. That's one of the reasons I got into this because I was releasing music and when I was doing the interviews, they never heard the music. Like the interviews at some point became about something else. Mm. It's like, God damn, man. For once, I want to talk to somebody that actually know what it's like right. to do it. Like to put an album in the stores, to not get the feature that you wanted, to fucking, yeah, it's just a lot that goes into it that I think the average consumer has no idea about. When great artists want to give the fans what they want, right? For example, first person shooter mode and evil ways. Mm. Don't great artists run the risk of other artists uh, uh, having better bars than them on their own shit? Yeah. Like, how would you rate those two songs? Like, J. Cole and Drake on those particular two songs? Uh, I think First Person Shooter is a masterclass. Between I, the both? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. First Person Shooter is the real version of that. The second one is them just trying to come in and, and do some shit real quick. But <laughs> the first one... They they spent some time on, they spent some time on that. A lot of integrity in that record, and it sounds like it's a great record. I mean, I was only disappointed that I was disappointed in how Drake decided to attack the record, right? Like this great record, this great beat, J Cole. I just thought he would rise to the occasion, and he handled it more so. Like I just want to create a great record, mm -hmm. perfect, well within his right. But yeah, people are gonna hear that and and speak to it. So you speaking to it? Who had the hardest bar? Uh, J Cole. Yeah, on that song. I mean, I, yeah, I, I ain't even know the answer. In my opinion. Hey, it's confusing me. I mean, I mean, because he gonna get more credibility. Like this, for example, if I'm running the ball, they gonna ask me about a running back. That probably carry more weight. I'm asking a rapper or a former rapper <laughs> yeah, no. about rappers. So it's, hey, it's, it's that's Cole. his thoughts. Should I want to hear him say hey, it. I know who I like. I thought, you, I thought it was a trick question. No, no, you I know who I like. <laughs> Me had, too. I, I thought you had something up no, your no, sleeve. I, I, man, who you think? <laughs> you, I'm aiming at you, Ukrainian or uh, yeah, something about yeah, Russia, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. shit, J. He Cole. Went crazy. Yeah, he was crazy. 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 The like, whole fucking track. You were the first person to start, like, phone videoing they woman, right? Wasn't you like the... Um, the originator? Well, it had to be because we, I wasn't okay. using the phone at that point. What was that? It was a camcorder. That was a camera. So what made you just decide that you were going to start following your woman like around the house and filming her and, and putting that out? Because you almost musically, when I really listened, then like the, the mood music was like my little brother's like super emo. And so that's he just come to my house and just put right. it in. Yeah, you know right, what I mean? God damn it. And, and like we just sit and listen, and I'd be like, "You good though? Yeah. And like, like you okay?" But then there's like love and hip hop. Yeah. And Joe Button. All that shit is pretty right. Good like, like too. there's like, there's a lot of layers into that. Like love and, like honestly, love and hip hop. Joe Button, like had women. You no, know? all the Joe Buttons had women. <laughs> <laughs> Every level. Just so we clear, <laughs> at every level there was. But you kind of like you're kind of a lover, man. Like yeah. underneath, underneath all of that, talk talk to a I'm little a bit. I'm a lover at my core. I'm vulnerable. I'm sensitive. I got feelings too, man. <laughs> I just present a certain way. But yeah, I'm a lover. I ain't with none of that. I'm not with none of that posturing shit, man. I love, and I love to love. And you get fucked up loving sometimes, right. but. uh back to recording your significant other. At that time, you know, I just said that the label tried to make me be everything that I wasn't. So that was for years. So in my brain, let me embrace the things that are true, the things that are valid and real to me. And at that time, that was me and my relationship. And I thought that that would give me like an upper hand because nobody was doing that. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody. I, I've come from the era where niggas was denying having a girl. Yeah. Girl, yeah. wife, you couldn't show none of that shit. But niggas wasn't showing their real house. Niggas wasn't showing you nothing. So I just started bugging out. I just started taking the camera, taping everything. My girl, my friends, trips to the car dealer, trip to the pizza place, just trips anywhere. And, and people fucked with it. People fucked with it. We couldn't even upload videos on YouTube past three minutes at, at right. one point. So it was a wild, wild ride. And that's, I want to ask you that too, because the same thing, just looking at all you've done and remembering that where I get, people come to me all the time and be like, I love how you talk about sexuality. 
Like, black men don't talk about sexuality. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Why do you think the black community, to your Tell point... Me, though, you call what you do say. talking about sexuality. Yeah. Okay. Because black, Chad, you black talk, men Chad. talk about sexuality, they talk about they, they got some head or they knocked down a girl. I'm, I, you got to go a little deeper. I'll talk about the patty milk. I'll talk about the rusty trombone. I'll talk about different things that we know everybody doing, but they don't want to bring up. But Ch- the, it, Channing, it, people don't know the names of that stuff, though. Yeah. You don't know what the patty milk is? The patty milk and the rusty trombone, no. You don't know what them two... Th- I know what the, pat- that's, that's, that's first grade. What's the patty milk? When a woman's laying on the bed on her stomach, right? And you behind her, so it's doggy style. But then you grab her wrist for leverage. And there's nowhere she can go. That seemed like a wheelbarrow. Bro. That was that no. was advanced first grade. <laughs> <laughs> what first grade? You God went to. Damn. And what's the and what's the the rusty trombone? You gotta look that one up because I can't even. That's pretty nasty. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> don't know what it is. Nope. Okay. So be- <laughs> I don't know so, what it is. so because on this show you have talked about behaving like a stray kitten. Yeah. On your porch. Just a little, just man, just a little, little faux play when you right. a different person. I, I don't kink shame on my show. I don't kink shame. Whatever people into <laughs> is what they into. Every people got wild kinks. A lot of them are not discussed on the broadcast. So I don't kink shame. Niggas want to get the little uh, kitten leash <laughs> put around them and walked around. <laughs> hey, get your <laughs> shit off. <laughs> get your every, shit off. Every time you 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 having a sexual encounter, you're not always Joe Budden. You might be something else. Oh, I role played 100. percent See, that's what I love about it. Why? I, why? I speak candidly. Yes. So ain't nothing that we gonna get yeah, to. But he, that, he he's changing it up though, because that wasn't the conversation. He's talking about sexuality. He's talking about being in the urinal. Having a conversation side by side with the guy that's pissed. I saw him say that. I did yeah. see you say that. And he's talking it. about, oh, it's feeling confident enough to say, oh, he's fine. It's a whole different thing. Can you, can you, we'll say it. Can you, can you, can you, can you I'm, and listen, I'm heterosexual male, Joe. <laughs> but they give me a hard time because I can see a man and be like, that's a good looking motherfucker right there. Oh, I do that. Yeah, that's, but Chen, I, I didn't that. say nothing was wrong. Now, see, Freddie? I, I don't want to, I don't want him to start talking to me at the urinal. <laughs> but that's me. I like my urinal time to be like. Why I gotta be so solid? Why you gotta look at the ground in the bathroom? I, oh, I ain't looking that. at the ground. I'm up. I'm up. But Straight you- ahead. <laughs> I might be on my. I might be on my phone. Yeah. Like, I know my dick ain't move. I know where it's aiming. I've done it. Like I don't need to concentrate here. But yeah, homeboy's standing okay, next to me. You can get into your question. I was What's just. It? You said sexuality. I was gonna say yeah. Why? Why? Why is it so taboo to talk about sexuality in the black community? Well, shit. Are they talking about it in other communities? White people. They talk. What they say? Oh, white dudes. I hang out with white people. They'll be talking about fucking their wife to you. Yeah, I gave Laura hell last night, man. Yeah, we were on the porch. <laughs> yeah, man, the fire pit was on and we went crazy. They'll talk about okay. it. Okay. Black folks don't do that. It's just it's this taboo thing that I am trying to break. That's funny. I don't I don't think I ever noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> see, but that just, it just it seems funny to me. Well, Chan, I think the thing is the the way we grew up, our the, the elders of our community told us that things stay in our house. They grew up differently. Like, you, you, they, they come from a place where that may have been comfortable. Like, your mama, at least my mama, ain't want me to talk about a conversation they had in the house, yeah. much less have them go out and speak about what they do behind closed doors. I think that's more of like a cultural community thing with business in general. But he says half white. Good point. I'm trying to bring y'all over. You trying to break the side. white shit over. Trying I'm to trying to break the cold, man. We, we 400 years back. Oh, We've been doing God. this shit for years. Oh, my pocket's light, champ. I'm going to go and holler at our sponsors over at DraftKings, though, so I can roll into the new year with the dough. Any new customer signing up right now on the DraftKings Sportsbook app, use the promo code PIVOT, place a $5 bet, and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. And I ain't even got a New Year's resolution. I got a New Year's parlay. <laughs> Y'all know I love those same game parlays, multiple bets in the same game. I love them. And you get the no sweat bets. You have a bet, if that bet loses, they gonna get your bonus bet right there. That's what you got for your New Year's. Congratulations. Ain't nothing like taking a little extra into the New Year, right? Listen, DraftKings Daily Fantasy. If Sportsbook isn't in your area, Go to Daily Fantasy, they'll look out for you. And remember, any new customer signing up with the promo code PIVOT, you place a $5 bet, you get $150 in bonus bets instantly.
So we had to text her it, you and I, after D1 was on the show. Yeah, man. And uh, what y'all thought of that? I like him. That's your man. Yeah, I like him. And, no, but, and, no, 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 no. I like him. That's different. The, the audience need. That's my friend. That's different from I like him. I got his number when I DM'd him. He was like, hey, man, like, I would love for you to come on the show and we can have a conversation oh, about okay. this. I've run into him. We've talked. I've I, never met him. Yeah, I know enough people that know him to know that dude has really good intentions. And to know that as you are consistently you, he is also consistently him. And what is the difference, in your opinion, between what you do as a podcaster, as someone who gives their opinion about music, as opposed to what he's doing and what he feels is his approach into the content of others as it affects the community? 97% of the time on my show, we, we try to have everybody's best interests. Okay. And if we say something that somebody didn't like, I'd be on the phone 24 seven behind the scenes, like just communicating. I don't think I could even do my job if I wasn't held in a certain, if I wasn't held in a certain regard by not only my peers, but by some of the people that helped to make the music business run, right? If I started just spewing fuck shit or attacking people, mm -hmm or pointing out certain things, yeah, I don't think that wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't sit right with my soul. We try not to do that. And so. That was my only beef. With yeah, yeah, what like, he I'm did, sorry. And so like, way. I asked him, I asked him, I said, okay, one, one, because he is biblical, I asked him about grace, right? I said, where's the grace and understanding of the foundation of these people, where they come from, and what their approach is and what they're trying to do, the money that they're trying to make. So I ask him that question. I also ask him, could his approach be different? If you're truly trying to create a place of, of conversation and understanding, can you approach it differently? Because for me, it doesn't matter if you tell me you love me, if the stuff that follows, I don't vibe with. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. If I don't feel the approach to what follows is respectful, we're never having a conversation. At least we're never having a conversation that will be fruitful in any way. Fact. That was my question to him. Do, does he think he could go about changing it in, in any way? Do you have a problem with his opinion or just his no, approach? I have no problem with him, his opinion, his mission. I don't, I don't know enough about him to have any problem with him. I have zero problem with him. D1, like he has a huge fucking mission, first of all. You gotta like shrink the world to get a certain group of people to understand. You watch wrestling growing up? Mm -hmm. You watch wrestling? Yeah. At what age would you guys say kids realize that that shit's fake? Pretty early for me. Okay. But it was so still it, but it was still enough entertainment. That so I was it's entertainment, them. right, right, yeah. right. So even with the music game, like which is what D is trying to say, taking the art from reality and having people separate the two. Like at what age, people who follow hip hop, at what age do they understand that this guy, this is narration and this is over, central, over, over emphasizing bullshit? Oh, that could be never. That's what he's trying to say. He's like, that's the poison. That's the devil's poison is what he called it. So it's a hell of a mission. And a lot of times it's just easy to say, you know what, if you don't want to listen, just don't listen. But he's not, that's not his approach. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is, I, I, I like what he's trying to do, but the uphill fight, he, I, don't, I don't know if it'll succeed. I'm with you, because you said that in a nicer way than I was about to say something. Yeah. No, say it. I, I, no, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say that. Yeah, doing it that way just seemed like you're running in place. That just seemed like you chasing your tail in a circle like my dog used to do, right? Like, if that's your mission, which awesome, then you enter, you enter a place full of sinners mm -hmm. because that's what hip hop is. That's also, as ugly as it is, it's also one of the most beautiful things about hip hop is that hip hop welcomes all. Okay. The drug users, drug dealers, pimps, prostitutes, dropouts, hip hop take you with open arms. So for that to be his approach in this space, just it doesn't seem like it would yield the best 
results when you start highlighting people and talking about what are in their lyrics, I guess, right? Like that, I would hate for somebody to pull up all Joe Budden lyrics, mm. read them, and think that they can now have a better, a better sense of who I am if they never met me, mm. right? You take away from artistic approach that way, is, is what I think. So, yeah, I just thought it was sloppy. Joe, what, what do you feel then when you hear someone when you yourself say you've dealt, you very public about things you've dealt with from a mental health standpoint mm -hmm. and trying to advocate for those things, mm -hmm. even public about suicidal thoughts and mm -hmm. attempts. When an artist says your words pushes people to think about suicide. Who said that? Logic. Uh, oh, logic is full of shit. Logic is full of shit. I don't believe it. How, if you have dealt with this, if you've actually dealt with suicidal thoughts, if you've dealt with things from a mental health standpoint, how can you, if he says it, what makes it, what makes you, you know prove, he's full you, of crap? You can't, you can't know and you can't prove it. But logic is full of shit. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, logic what, makes you, what makes you think just, he's full? Just his, his, oh, now, oh, now he gonna go for the next six months. Just logic, logic put out a song with, a ment with mental health is the phone number. 1-800, whatever the fuck that shit was. Pandering bullshit. Everything about logic is pandery. So there's really no way to ever tell what's truthful and what's not truthful. So let me say that. And since he said that, I try to take him off my list of people to speak about because I mm. do have a heart, right? But I do think he's full of shit. <laughs> I do think he's full of shit. When you were, though, going through your stuff, what allowed you to get through? Because I felt like it bled through with your music. Like in your music, you could hear you were going through things. How do you get to this point? How did you get to the, to the other side of it? Oh, shit. Many a sleepless nights, dark nights, rock bottom, church. That's really what it is. It's my, my higher power. My, my, my connection with my higher power pulled me out of many a... Uh, many of bad circumstances and just bad feelings and emotions. Like there's no other way to explain it. When you are just in the depths of hell, right? I'm talking to the mental health people out there. Like when you just don't see reason to live or be here anymore, it really is nothing but you and a higher power at that point. There is nothing here that could do it. Yeah, it was just God. Rest in peace to my, my pastor Ron. When you say like attempts though, you said there's less than five. For you, when you said you actually attempted, what does that mean? Does that mean that you gave it thought, you put yourself in that position, or you legitimately tried to take your life? I went about trying to do that. I, for me anyway, started the process of what this world looks like without me. I've done that with blades. I've done that with some other things that I won't say here, but wow. yeah, I've done it. I thought about jumping. Any way there is to do it, I thought about. Yeah. Way to keep it light on the pivot. <laughs> I, had, I, I was going off talking shit with people. That was my next question, but. Give it to me. <laughs> no, even that, man, it's, it's a saying. And it's funny because it's new, like, there's new media, the podcasting and all. This is all new stuff. And that phrase, journalistic integrity, mm. where we've had guys on the show where dudes, be, they, they'll start going and they get comfortable and they start going and be like, yeah, if I see that dude, I'm going to whoop his ass. And we, we'll stop and be like, bro, we're going to re-ask the question because we can't. For your sake, we don't want to release that. I'm a subscriber. Do y'all, like, do you, have you ever stopped anybody? Or do you ever, on, on your podcast, do you, that journalistic integrity where you mm. say, this can't be released. I, you, oh, we yes. should not put this All out. of the time. All of the time that happens. Yeah. Very often that happens where we got to stop, have a talk, Take some shit out, redo a whole episode, can an episode, all the time that happens. What would make you can a, a episode? Is it more for, because it doesn't seem like you would ever can one for fear of what people would think about you. Yeah. Is it thinking about others to I mean, make others. sure that they're in good spaces? Yeah, it's, it's normally others, right? It's normally my co-hosts. Uh, recently, we did, a, we did an episode right when that Puff stuff was breaking. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we left, something happened. What happened as soon as we left? Something happened to where everything we just said 
was no longer current. Okay. And that was a Friday night. We had to just stay up for hours just splicing this shit, splicing it, because it just, I like for our shit to be as close to real time as, as, as can be, so. I think I saw you say something about going on live and having to can the whole episode. Yeah, we, we scrapped. I think he settled. Like an hour 20 in that episode. He settled within 24 hours. He settled yeah, is what happened. What he settled. And we didn't, we didn't address any of that. So, yeah, for, for, scrap it. Like something, like you take, you take something like Puff and what has now happened to his reputation based off of whether it's the civil suit with Cassie, the settlement, or now the daily story that comes out. Yeah, it's massive now. Right, about his perversion, mm -hmm. it seems. For someone who has been accused of things, how do you approach that? Is it because, you know, you've spoken up about being accused of domestic violence or whatever these things are, so you understand being in that place. Mm. Is there ever for you that sort of feeling like, okay, this is about something I've been accused of or something I've had to address, so let me address it from the perspective of, of a certain understanding? Yes, and in today's era of the internet, that's tough to do, right? right? When, when these stories break, I try to wait for facts. <laughs> I yeah. try to be patient, give time, time, but everything is so instantaneous today. So waiting for facts, I'm like, oh, fuck you, you scared to talk? Right. But yeah, nah, I remember, I remember when I, when I went through it. I went to court three years for one, for one, one of those instances in New York. And the young lady, she didn't, she didn't show up at all for three years. I was, boy, was I mad, but I didn't do it. Fight for your name, right? Like they teach you, if you didn't do it, don't take no plea, mm -hmm. go fight. So, I mean, I fought. I know, and I know what it's like to have a, a judge looking at you like you did some of the shit that they saying, and then at the last minute, a key piece of evidence come that just explain everything. Like, it, it, get, it get thick. I didn't understand how bad it got back then, because like I said, I was broke. So, really wasn't nothing you could do to me. But, yeah, when you have things going for yourself and those types of stories break, I'm off a of puff because a lot of that shit was that, yeah, I don't even talk, think about that. But when you got something going for yourself, public perception and the court of Jeez. public opinion is, is yeah. It's, it's reality though. People, yeah. people, begin, people begin to make decisions on you, whether mm. how they want to deal with you, how they want to associate with you based on your perception mm -hmm. because your perception is what sells, right? Because mm -hmm. in truth, if you do a show like you do or a show like we do, people get to know you because we give a lot of ourselves. We speak about the things that we're talking about based on our experiences. So a lot of times we're telling stories about our lives in order to give you an analogy or a comparison or paint a picture about what we're talking about. Yeah. But in most cases, we don't know people like entertainers, like you don't, you know their music, you don't know them. Mm -hmm. Right? And so your perception is truly what people are buying. Yeah. Like in our case, in a, in a very simplistic term, it's like me, if I talk about a safety getting beat, right? I'd be like, oh, you know, you look at this play, he's supposed to be in this coverage, he, get beat, so he gets beat over the top. The next thing that'll happen from that fan base, they'll pull up a video from 2008 where I gave up a touchdown. And I'll be like, I know, that's how I know what he did. <laughs> and so for you, being someone who is authentic and very unapologetic about your true feelings, is there ever a fear for you where you like, man, like I want to say that, but I went through this in 2017 and this might come up and they might feel this way about me. No, or for no, not at all. At this point, people feel however they feel about me. I'm, I'm, I'm in total alignment with God. So I don't give a fuck what people say. I don't, I don't do that. Right. And we, and we try to be sensitive on our show to, your matters. Sensi your sensitivity is. I, I do, but I do try to be sensitive. I do try to be sensitive. Even though some of those things that I was accused of were not true, something is true, right? Some, something about the part that I played got me here in this spot. Whether that be where are you meeting these women, what are you doing, what are you going through with these women that you keep having this type of thing happen so you got to do some real self-reflection 
You got to do some real internalizing, go talk to God, a therapy. You got to go get it together. Today, I'm pretty holistic. So I never worry about what people are saying. I'm, I'm living my life in a manner in which I'm okay with whatever you're saying out there. Going back to the whole scrapping uh, episodes and protecting your people, your, your co-hosts. Uh, you recently uh, said you guys ride with Mel based on some comments that were said out there. Y'all niggas do your little homework. I mean, what you gotta do is open the phone. Y'all niggas, god damn. <laughs> Just gotta open the phone yes. and shit's on Instagram. Yes, we had to ride with Mel. We rode with Mel. Let me speak for me. I rode with Mel. That don't mean that I agree with what, what she did or with what she said, but I stand by her. I stand by her when she's right. I stand by her when she's wrong. And if if we dealing with somebody who's just gonna who's just gonna throw darts, throw darts, I'd rather you throw them at me. And with, with all of that, you talk about business. You've done amazing in this space, man. Um, I know us being a young podcast and trying to figure this thing out and still grow. You've pretty much solidified yourself. Is there an exit strategy for you? Like, what's what's next? I do think about exit strategy, but at the same time, I also think about how to turn podcasting upside down again, mm. right? It seems like everybody is podcasting, everybody started one, everybody like social is, media, no? Yeah, everybody's in their groove, but what, what does the next evolution of this look like, or is this just it? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that this is just it, so I, that's what I rack my brain with. How do I turn podcasting upside down or create this other vertical or just, you know, just take it somewhere where it's not yet. I can't get to exit strategy before I do that. You said you're gonna uh, take a day off when you're 50. When I'm 50, when I'm 50. When I'm... That, th that sort of, of work ethic, where do you find like your time to recharge, recharge your time to reflect, to look at some of the things that you've done and accomplished and give it, give yourself your flowers. Like it's one thing to know I can go start something else. It's a different thing to feel a sense of pride in the hard work, not necessarily the accomplishment, but the effort. Mm -hmm. Like I'm an effort dude, you know what I mean? Cause like I don't always, I'm not always gonna control the success of everything. It's not always gonna mean that people are gonna like it or it's gonna blow up or it's gonna be this. But to me, it's about the dedication I put into each day being the best I could possibly be and trying to make the people around me the same way. And they know, it, man, like I'm ripping and running, just always working, always looking for the next thing, always trying to one up this, but I'm trying to get better about, well, let me sit back and look at how far I've come. Do you ever look at from what it was in 2015, man, 2016, this different iterations, different chances you've taken on, on yourself, betting yeah. on yourself and go, damn, Hell yeah. I did that. I do that daily, right? Like I'm a morning person, so I'll get up at four in the morning and just sit crisscross applesauce in the bed and just reflect. That's my time alone. Waking up four or five in the morning, I got about two hours till this phone started going crazy. And yeah, that's my time for me and my peace. But I'm also at peace with knowing that the people that move like you just described, like you and I, you just might not get your flowers. Mm -hmm. I'm so at peace with that part too. And that's why I say I'll get a day off when I'm 50. When I'm 50, I'd like to look up, see where all that hard work, will, and determination landed me and see if I could sniff some flowers. And if not, then another five to 10 year plan is in effect and we'll yeah. see where 60 gets me. But I'm not slowing down so somebody can hand me a flower or so I can smell a flower. I'm not. Isn't that like a rule when you're running, like not to look back? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> Can't run fast looking this way. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. true, that's true. You say look back, Joe. You say living in peace. You piss off a lot of people. Do I? It's news to me. It's news, we can't be speculative. So I'll let you know, I'm <laughs> glad I brought something to you. You piss off a lot of people. Okay. You piss off a lot of people. <laughs> they you, need therapy then. But you, <laughs> but, do, but do you- Cause mean, it ain't you, huh? Dog, you in charge of your emotions. You in charge of what piss you off. You in charge of what makes you happy, feels good. It's, that's you in charge of that. These people, I don't have that significant of a role in their life, the customizing of it or the altering of it for me to make these people upset. And if they are, it's not a me issue. If I went to bed with the weight of what everybody else felt about Joe Budden, then how would I sleep? That's not even self-care for Joe Budden. Yeah. 
I have to not ever give a fuck that there's somebody out there that's mad at something that Joe Budden did. Especially when I'm so I'm so easy to talk to. If I fucked it up, I'll make amends. Wow. We could communicate. I'm not purposely trying to be a dick. Like if somebody feel the way, then we really just had an altercation or something happened that yeah. we couldn't work through or you couldn't work through. Because I'm pretty amendable. <laughs> but you move fine. You ain't never no no Beat nowhere in the city. Drum. No, no, but nowhere anywhere in the city, nowhere any state, any city that you when you go there, you fly there, you kind of. A little, a little trepidatious about being there. Oh, well, I mean, we come from where we come from. I mean, I'm, I look around no matter where I'm at. Yeah. I'm looking around. If I'm home, if I'm in places I'm all too familiar with, normally I'm in those places because I'm all too familiar with it. I know the owner, the manager, the security. I know where all the back doors is, upstairs, downstairs, secret compartments. Like, I try to, I'm, that's where my mind is. Yeah. So that's here. That's L.A. That's Detroit. That's Texas. That's, you know, that's where we move. Miami. Yeah. That's everywhere. How long your podcast been around? Uh, we started in 2015, February 2015. 2015. So we got like six more years before we can get a paddock, fellas. Oh, but that that knock it. Knock it. Hey, hey, hey. He got six watches, though. I'm they, watch. That's what he chose to I wear today. I got an Apple watch. That's so, what he chose to wear today. He can't fool me. Nah, but we usually ask our guests their biggest pivot. Podcasting is easily my, my biggest pivot. Uh, Rap was all I knew. Music was all I knew, all I knew how to do. It was the only way I ever made any money. It was how I sustained myself. It was how I expressed myself. It was how people knew me. It was how people loved me. Mm -hmm. So boy, was it a process for me, I'm talking about only for me, to say I'm letting it go. I'm not gonna do the only thing I've ever been amazing at in my life. I'm gonna try something totally different and for me to be successful at that thing, I have to really not go back to that, mm. right? Rappers say they retire and nobody ever believes it. Nobody believed it when I said it. Like I'm just, I'm probably the only one to say I'm retiring and, stop. and stopped yep. for now. So, I mean, that was, that was a tough process for me. That was really, really, really tough for me, especially when we started podcasting, we weren't making the money. It wasn't about that. It was about the transition and the change and the pivot, but that was that was really tough, really tough. I used to be a fan of your music, bro. Oh, thank you. Really did. For I, sure. I, I appreciate yeah. that. It's and, been a while since I heard. Yeah, it, but. but listen, Ryan Ryan knows this, but I'll tell y'all, I'm a call away at yeah. any time. Yeah. At any time, I'm a, I'm gonna make myself available for the people I fuck with. So, That's so sad. thank you, and and I extend that to y'all. Man, appreciate I'm, I'm, it, I'm, for dog. sure. I fuck with y'all. It's love. My dog. Wow. Uh, what, what's a panic? Hold up, limitless, take a simic cap pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust, limitless, take a simic cap pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling.